a chair for Community Energy. Hey, hey. <laughs> And for those of you who were in the room in 2017, it inspired books, it inspired films, it inspired my own um, uh, involvement in the community energy. Um, so um, today, I hope you take um, away inspiration and a few ideas as well. So Saul Griffith, I should also say that I do the energy market reform with Rewiring Australia. You heard earlier from Saul Griffith, our um, chief, chief research officer, about um, uh, the path to electrification, but only if you have financing available to you. So um, what we're going to hear about today is how do we then get financing for our community energy projects? Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit basically a about the clear sky solar model and uh, which is a trust model and also then about the solar ambassador program and urban renewable energy zones um, and more to that later but first of all um, we are the Northern Beaches chapter of uh, clean energy for eternity and that's where it all started for me uh, as uh, Vicky mentioned, I was a councillor in Boringa Council from 2008 to 2012, and uh, that's where I met Warren Yates, a fellow councillor in Mossman Council, who introduced me to Clean Energy for Eternity. Clean Energy for Eternity has always inspired me. Founded in 2006 by Matthew Knott and Prue Kelly uh, in the Bega Valley and in Tasra, they've done fantastic things like lots of you know, human signs, um, you, as you can see down here, um, and just recently, oh, thank you. Um, just recently, we have done the Climate Action Now sign across basically various chapters uh, on uh, here across Australia. We have multiple chapters now, um, and then Clear Sky, uh, Clean Energy for Eternity also has the Imagine Solar Farm, which is a fantastic collaboration. And this is all about finance and partnerships. So really critical a partnership with the local council, and it spells Imagine in solar panels and is community funded. Um, that solar farm. So I was really inspired, and in 2012, Warren and I, we were councillors, but we didn't get re-elected. It was the Tony Abbott era. It was very much about, you know, uh, July, you know, climate tax, etc. And because we were always supporting localised community energy and renewable energy, um, there was just a lot of community sentiment, unfortunately. But that meant we had a lot of time on our hand. And um, in, in I, I had this idea, I think, since about 2004. As you can hear, I'm German. And I was back in Germany in 2004. And my sister told me, and she said, listen, I got this new solar system on my roof, and it didn't cost me anything. And I went, how did that happen? And she's like, oh, well, I'm going to pay for the energy for 10 years, basically, that it's generating. And after 10 years, they will give me the system for free. And I have another 15 years of cheap energy or free energy then from my roof. And I thought, wow, this is an amazing model. Now, that was because Germany had the Energiewende in 2002. So there was incredible support, including a feed-in tariff for en renewable energy. Now, Australia was slightly different. So in 2012, there was no, uh, not many, or we couldn't find any power purchase agreements. Um, and we didn't know how to start it, basically, because we didn't have the funds. We had volunteers uh, in the Northern Beaches chapter of Clean Energy for Eternity, but we didn't have the funds to really get going. And fortunately, in 2013, the Office of Environment and Heritage under Rob Stokes, and I'm, I'm delighted to see Joachim here and Pingala, some of the original community energy groups, there was funding available for community energy projects. And of course, we submitted our application. And with Joachim and Pingala, we basically were lucky to get the funding. It was $58,000 in our case, not much really. And it gave us the funding that we needed to develop the business model, to develop the IT infrastructure, to develop all the contracts, pay our legal advisors. And we had fantastic lawyers on the case, uh, including Dominic. Green and Jackie Townsend, who were really, really fantastic. And we managed to develop a, a business model, which is, 
is completely compliant with ASIC and the Corporations Act and the financial regulations in Australia, and that was really critical. And our mission became, so the overall mission of uh, clean energy for eternity is to accelerate the uptake of clean energy production in Australia. We had mottos like 50-50 by 2020, uh, which unfortunately we had to change to 100% by 2030, uh, but our mission became to empower local communities to benefit not only um, uh, environmentally but economically from the production of clean energy because there's money in it if you think about it you can save money you can make money and so we realize we need to not just preach to the converted which we do in this room we need to reach the people that are not ready on board and that may not be interested in saving the planet or acting on climate change. We need to talk to the people that are more interested in the financial benefits of clean energy. And it is, as we all know, it's an absolute no-brainer, but we had to communicate that clearly and we had to make it accessible. So... The model of clean, clear sky is, is quite simple. It's a trust model, so we are regulated under the financial regulations, limited to $2 million investment per project and a maximum of 20 investors per project. Um, so that's the boundaries within we, which we operate. So we link community investors to high-quality solar projects on commercial roofs. Anything smaller than 15 kilowatt normally is not worth that kind of uh, setup. So you have to work on commercial roofs. And ideally, you work with businesses that will use the energy uh, seven days a week during solar hours. And businesses are ideal because they will use that energy during the day. So that's a perfect target. Now, that's, uh, and so we link them up and we aim for a shared value model. So we provide cheaper energy to the rooftop owner cheaper than they can get from the grid and for the contract duration five to ten years depending on the location and the project size etc um, the rooftop owner will pay the investors for the energy generated on the roof we aim for seven to eight percent internal rate of return and um, after ten, seven to ten years, um, it is donated back, that the system is donated to the rooftop owner, and they receive another 15, you know, 17 years of free energy from their roof. So it's a fantastic model of real win-win situation. Um, yeah, so oh, I mentioned the limitations, basically. I, I don't think we need to go, uh, yeah. Um, so that was our first um, um, basically launch project. In 2013, September, we launched with a 15 kilowatt system on the Bogabri pub, funded by um, the pub patrons. And that, was just, and that was our start, basically. So very humble beginnings uh, in 2013. And we just celebrated our 10th anniversary. We had Rob Stokes and Sally and Sophie, uh, all our the wonderful people that really, really are, are so supportive. Uh, we had them with us. And we have grown now to projects all across Australia, basically. We tend to aim... Uh, for basically getting the fundi funding as close as possible to, to the business, basically. So we, we prefer projects where we can have the, the beer drinkers and the beer club and the, and the employees pay for the solar system. But we have so many members registered on, on for, Clear, for Clear Sky that if there is a shortfall, we can expand in concentric circles and really raise all the funding required for the solar system. Two million can be a lot and we need investors uh, that basically can can achieve um, uh, basically that investment it means if there's a, a two million dollar project basically the the on initial investment goes up to quite a considerable amount so we have a lot of uh, self-managed super funds basically uh, investing we have now basically uh, we've raised uh, over 25 million uh, and we have installed over 19, so you can see the increase how we have grown over time. Um, so up to over 25 minutes, or over, we're actually now over 19 megawatt installed capacity. So that's the installed capacity. So we have achieved over 19 megawatt at the moment. And we have raised over 25 million 
uh, in community invest investment. And that means that initial investment from the OEH, the $58,000, has been raised by us over 430 times. Uh, so, and that that's, it shows the power that these government funds have for community groups and the importance. Without OEH funding, we would not be here. So we have to be so grateful to Rob Stokes, and we have to reiterate to all our elected representatives the importance and the benefits of funding community energy. That kind of kind of payback, if you would get that from a commercial project, they would be all over it, basically. And we can we can provide these incredible benefits and return for our governments. Um, now Solar Alliance basically came about in 2022, we launched, uh, and it came from, we all know that on, on residential roofs we have a pretty good uptake in Australia. Uh, the government loves to point out our percentage of residential uptake, um, but we're lagging behind in uptake of solar systems on commercial roofs, especially small and medium scale, scale uh, commercial roofs. And we were wondering why, because the benefits are so clear for businesses, much more evident than for residential. Residential is not the ideal situation for a solar project, because residents tend to be at work, not use the energy. Businesses are optimal because they use the energy during the day. And so the question is, what are the issues? And um, our aim is to create pilots for urban renewable energy zones. We don't need remote renewable energy zones. We need to have these, these solar systems on the local roofs where the energy is produced and used, because then we don't need less investment in grid infrastructure, because the energy does not need to be transferred across huge distances. So what we need is really to look into how can we empower local industrial zones to dramatically increase the uptake of renewable energy. Um, so that's the team. Kylie is here as well, which is wonderful. Um, and we, that's when we launched in 2022. And we're working with Zero Emission Sydney North. I hope Felicity is still here. Uh -huh, Felicity is back here. Big shout out to uh, Zero Emission Sydney North, now Zero Emission Solutions, I, I understand. Yeah. Um, Ah, oh, fantastic. I've got two minutes. So the vision is to create an urban renewable energy zone. We use community-based social marketing. It is all about basically, um, so that's the big vision. Um, so this is Brookwell, one of our first ones. You can see the solar panels that are already installed. And the vision is for a massive you know, solar farm basically on, on the local roofs. Um, that's the big idea. Uh, but it's about community-based so, so, social marketing. So we have solar champions. You need to create that trust level. So we have solar champions, businesses at the forefront, like Colormaker here on this photo. Um, they get plaques, solar champion, basically similar to what Felicity has for households. <laughs> so it's all about making it visible so people can say, these are our heroes. And we expose them, so we try to help them into onto Instagram, celebrate them there, create drinks where they can present, you know, their stories. And then we have the solar ambassadors, and these are local volunteers that donate their time and they're trained to support the businesses to really, uh, you know, get on it. So we we use Sunspot and we use Solar Quotes. Uh, we're working with Sunspot at the moment to basically see how. Our needs can be met by Sunspot even better. Fantastic system. And we have training programs for the volunteers. Um, and that train them to basically do the assessment of return on investment, etc., for the solar systems. And then to help the business to get the quotes, review the quotes, and then manage the installation. And just be that little helping hand. And it came from a human-centered design approach where we looked into what are the pain points, what are the opportunities for businesses, what are the jobs to be done, basically, for all the HCD and IDO fans, uh, what are the jobs to be done, and what do we need to provide as a community organization to help them across that process. And that's how we designed it. Now, for all the HCD fans, uh, customer profiles, basically, um, they were critical. We have owner-occupiers, low-hanging fruit. Most of them already have solar power. 
We're currently running into issues with Strata, so we're working on Strata support at the moment. And the big issue is really around property owners and developers that are not using the energy and have no direct benefit. Some of it will need to be calls on local government and state government to make it mandatory in every DA to install solar in the future. And we need all of you to push for that, basically, in your community groups, hopefully, uh, support that. And we also need to showcase uh, companies like Stables at Horton, uh, lifestyle buildings. They're integrating solar everywhere in their buildings because they say um, it, makes, uh, the, it makes a much more attractive uh, lease for the leaseholders and a more attractive um, property for any property owners. So they are wonderful solar champion in, in that property space. And we need more of them, and we need to really communicate those. So we're currently working, we're talking partnership. We have a grant from our local council. We just signed an MOU uh, on the Solar Ambassador Training Program. It will become online, available to any community group interested in picking it up, running with it. There's an MOU, because what we want to do, the Solar Ambassador Program also analyzes industrial areas and uh, local streets for the residential. We look into how much can your neighbors fit on their roof, basically, and then we give them a targeted letter written by council in support with the community energy organization, trust, basically, and uh, basically saying X amount of people in your street have solar, uh, social comparison, very powerful. Um, why don't you? And we have looked at your roof. That's how much you can install. That's how much you can save. Do you want support? The council will link you up with this volunteer group, and they will help you. So it's it's a new program. We're testing different approaches at the moment, from like kitchen table conversations to parties to this approach, uh, to see what works in in the community energy sector. Yeah. So that's what we're doing at the moment. Uh, and I, I tried to be short, um, but yeah, that's the Solar Ambassador Program. And we thought all these amazing people, and you, this is the 2014 Congress, basically, in Canberra. Uh, we were all there, hopefully. Uh, welcome to the rewiring groups. Yay. We need you, too. Uh, yeah, and wonderful to just have everybody here. I, I'm so excited about meeting everybody again. So, Christine, it's going to take, grab a microphone and take one question from the floor while I do some machinations. If I manage to get a microphone. <laughs> Thank you. That's yeah. great. That's really nice. um, um, so, what happens in the instance that you've invested, uh, you're, you've invested a solar system on a third party property and that property gets sold? Oh, fantastic question. I didn't have to talk about this during my presentation, which was really tragic. Um, risk management is at the forefront of what we do because we have an incredible responsibility. We're managing money for other people, and we also have a reputational responsibility to the community energy sector. Everything we need to do or we do needs to be super, super risk averse and well managed. So we have contracts in place with the solar installation company, basically. If the business gets sold, there's a PPA agreement with the, with the host site, and they get bought out, basically. They buy out the solar system, and we make sure that the investors receive, at the minimum, uh, the projected um, uh, internal rate of return that was expected for that project. Um, a lot of the projects perform a above the internal rate of return that was expected, um, but we aim to get at the minimum that. And we had to manage other projects uh, where we had to deal with bankruptcy. Uh, so we have special contracts. And I should mention, we would not exist without the solar installation company being super passionate about community energy, uh, a smart commercial solar. They have given us incredible support, and they're underwriting a lot of the risk in these projects, and they're taking the hit 
uh, so that our investors never have to take the hit, really. Uh, so at the very worst, basically, we'll end up with uh, basically just the basic interest. Um, if a project fails before it goes into installation, uh, it will be the bank interest while we had parked the money um, uh, to go into in, into the installation. But yeah, so all the risk, we, we were really tight on risk management. Thanks very much, uh, Katria, for uh, stepping in, and we'll get <laughs> we'll get to my slides. So, as I said, my, my my topic is for discussion today, and it's around different financing models, uh, trust, and small small scale investments being one of them, um, but also equity versus debt, and paying back distributions versus uh, principal and interest versus on-bill credits as well, like the Haystack Solar Garden. So just a table of some of these options. I haven't fully categorised it all yet, but um, a finance type, one example is like uh, equity, just like owning a, a company, I guess. That could be a proprietary limited or limited company. Uh, generally, um, you're, you're not allowed to publicly raise for a company um, beyond $2 million or 20 investors uh, without an ASIC-approved prospectus. Um, and one example of a community energy project that, that did go down this path and got an ASIC approved prospectus uh, was SolarShare Canberra for their one megawatt community solar project. That's my understanding, I didn't work on it myself. Um, the next model um, is crowd equity. Um, and I, I have direct experience on this from the Grong Grong Solar Farm, which raised in 2022 and last year. Um, it's a one and a half megawatt project near Wagga. Um, in this case, crowd equity is relatively new legislation. Um, it's, uh, it exists in the UK and America and elsewhere, where it opens up um, small scale well, investments up to $10,000 uh, for like venture capital, new companies, startups, and these sorts of things. Um, in this legislation, you have to use a licensed intermediary. So we use Birchall, who have an AFSL dedicated to, to crowd finance. And you're allowed to publicly advertise the campaign. So normally for investments, you're not allowed to without certain approvals like uh, listing here. So you get to do a campaign video and, and so on. Um, and we use this on Grong Grong Solar Farm. Next is probably a more familiar one for community energy sector, which is uh, the, uh, using a cooperative structure. Uh, in this case, you have to do a disclosure statement. In New South Wales, it gets um, approved by Fair Trade Trading New South Wales. So it depends on your, your location about was a disclosure statement and, and how is that approved? Uh, examples of this are Goulburn Community Solar Farm who have raised $2.6 million for their 1.4 megawatt project that we're working with them on. Um, and also the Hepburn uh, Wind Farm now called Hepburn Energy used cooperative structure. Um, so on those first three that I've mentioned, I think one way of choosing the best model for a project could be like uh, choosing your, your worst, choosing the best enemy. Uh, who's going to approve this document and be good to work with? Is it ASIC? Is it a uh, business like Birchall or Swar Swarmer, a licensed intermediary? Or is it Fair Trading New South Wales? Um, so, and Haystack's also uh, used a cooperative, so Christy's here today and Nigel. Um, so if you wanted to find out more information on that process, I would definitely recommend speaking with them. Another option is debt. So rather than community ownership using debt, uh, some examples are Clear Sky uh, Solar and Repower Shoalhaven. Or well, Clear Sky Solar is actually trust and PPA, isn't it? Less, less of a loan model. Um, so debt has, a, debt has a, a few benefits, and I've got a slide on that later about why Repower Shoalhaven uh, recommend debt for their projects. And finally, uh, outside the ownership structure, equity versus debt, is uh, an option around on-bill credits. So that's rather than paying like distributions for your shareholdings, it's more about um, getting credits on your electricity bills. And this is what the Haystack Solar Garden is doing. This is common in community solar in the US and Ripple Energy uh, are making this popular in, in, the, in the UK at the moment. So some background on, on Como Energy. Uh, we're working on the Grong Grong Solar Farm and Goulburn Community Solar Farms, which are both in construction phase. Um, Grong Grong is a 1.5 megawatt community solar farm near Wagga, $5 million project, $1.9 million New South Wales government grant, and hosts the Haystacks Solar Garden. Goulburn Community Solar Farm I mentioned before. We're also working on two projects in development phase, the Manila Community Solar Farm, 5 megawatts just north of Tamworth in New South Wales, 
that has a $4 million uh, government grant, and the Bunyip Town Battery with solar farm as well. Um, Grong Grong Solar Farm, there's the, us at the pub and the, the, the design. Um, that was our community consultation. Also, Haystacks did some earlier community consultation as well to make sure that um, the, pro the community is aware and supportive of the project. Um, that's uh, on the right is uh, Gerald, um, the other director of Como Energy, with the landholders Gemma and Reiner, sussing out which was the best uh, location within their various farming lots to host the community solar farm. And you can see the nice, strong 11 kV distribution line that was key for us to decide on that location. On the left is our trackers being delivered to site, and that was quite exciting to start seeing more action happen. There's Christy from Haystacks and myself in front of the solar panels uh, around November last year after they were installed. And on the right is our inverter um, station being craned into site onto its concrete foot footing. So in terms of uh, finance on the equity side, uh, we in 2022 ran a crowdfunding process. Um, so that was using that crowd equity legislation. Um, it was real like a gamification style campaign, which was fun and energetic, but it was all about preparation then quite a short campaign. So four months to develop our logo and brand, get our messaging and comms website. Campaign video was a big thing because you can't start your EOI without the campaign video. That needs a first cut review by the intermediary, make sure it's financially compliant, final cut, and, and that was kind of the key thing on our timeline. Uh, developing the Facebook page and likes and so on and getting webinars going. Three weeks EOI, this is managed via virtual or the, the other um, the intermediary. And they, we, we got a thousand expressions of interest for people to invest and become shareholders of Grong Grong Solar Farm. Um, webinars were crucial during the EOI process. Uh, sponsored Facebook advertising is the key way that uh, companies on virtual um, get expressions of interest and in, in investment. And during that time, we got to evaluate how much we're likely to, to raise. Is it $100,000 or the maximum $3 million? Um, and with that information from the EOIs, we finalised our offer document and went into the invest, uh, investment open period. And uh, we did webinars, more sponsored ads and phone calls to a lot of those uh, EOIs and those who expressed higher amounts. Um, we, we really felt that, that webinars um, had the biggest uh, benefit. We'd just do half hour webinars, 15 minute presentation and quick Q&A. Um, so in our eight days, sorry, 1,000 was um, the second raise last year. So in our eight days, 744 EOIs. Then we opened for investment at 12 p.m. on a Tuesday and within 10 minutes we'd reached $100,000. So that was very exciting. <laughs> it's better than sitting there and waiting for that first investment. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all, it happened very quickly. We reached $250,000 in 80 minutes and $750,000 uh, in eight days, which was our, our maximum target at that time. Um, I remember uh, Gerald um, getting on, on the, in the second week on a Tuesday, how do we make, you know, how do we just make this happen? How do we make it close out? And we said, let's do another webinar. So we did two more webinars, a Wednesday and a Thursday. And on the Thursday night was the, this eighth day, and we were hoping it would close that night during the webinar, but it closed like half an hour after, <laughs> but we got there. In terms of the investors in the 2022 raise, um, we opened it up for as little as $250, and you can see 30% of the investors were $250, another 40% were $250 to $1,000. Uh, this is on the left pie chart. And then we had 5% uh, of investors were just $10,000, that's the maximum for uh, retail investors or non-sophisticated investors um, in crowd equity. Um, but also on the right side, um, those $10,000 investors uh, made up 28% of that $750,000, that funding. Um, so w when I add the Grong Grong Solar Farm, Goulburn, which we are supporting on their finance side, we're doing the development, um, and then also Manila Community Solar Farm, I was just adding it up yesterday, it adds up to uh, $5 million over the last three years of equity investments we've worked on into the community solar projects we're working on so far. So some learnings, the good, it was really fun and enjoyable. You can publicise it publicly and widely. Um, and the intermediaries take care of a lot of admin, the CRM, collection of investments and so on, and low setup cost. 
on the CRM side, I know the Goulburn uh, Community Solar Farm, they had a lot of pre people with people's handwriting when they wrote down their name, email, and phone number about investing on those investor nights. And that turned into a huge workload, like for chasing people. We didn't have to do that because virtual CRM handles that. Also, we're exhausted after day eight. We just wanted to you know, collapse in a couch or something like that. Luckily, they go and collect all the money. They manage that. We don't have to ring up anyone after the campaign. We can just relax. And quite a low setup cost. It was $900 up front from virtual and 6% of the raise. And you just had to, main cost was the campaign video and the branding and comms. The bad, uh, you come with additional reporting requirements. Um, so you have to do uh, annual financial reports on your website publicly. Um, over three million, I think you have to do audited. So that comes with like a five, six thousand dollar cost per annum. Um, you cannot provide forecasting unless it's contracted. So you cannot, because it's more around venture capital, crowd equity, you can't say we're going to be worth a billion dollars in three years' time. So we weren't even allowed to say how much we might earn in our first year of power um, generation. So that made it tricky. So definitely we couldn't provide, it's going to be you know, X percent returns or anything like that. And related parties, so Como Energy um, had the same director, has the same directors as Grong Grong Solar Farm, but he's working for Grong Grong Solar Farm, so they're related parties. So um, we had to disclose all the kind of contracted consulting steps that Como's doing for Grong Grong in the offer document and make sure that was all complying. Uh, so that's enough about crowd equity. On debt models, why would you do debt rather than equity? This is um, borrowed from Repower Shoalhaven's um, do document recently. Uh, so they say it's readily understood by investors, I would agree. Uh, it's easier for investors to process their annual tax returns because it's only the interest income that's accessible. So if you get paid back $1,000 in year one, $800 is principal, $200 is interest, only that $200 you need to uh, sh show to the ATO. Um, the principal is returned in predetermined amounts, so it's more certain and easier company accounts. So uh, if you set up the trust and it's a small scale investment, under $2 million, under 20 people, um, providing out a loan from that organisation is much simpler for that trust for the company accounts. So in terms of discussion, um, we heard before from the Energy Consumers Australia about this energy divide, how uh, lower socioeconomic status people are paying a much higher percentage of their income for on their electricity bills, six to 16%, whereas higher, so higher income earners or households are only paying one or 2%. Um, so one thing that's fantastic about the Haystack Solar Garden model is it provides on guilt bill credits. Thank you. So it can reduce people's electricity bills and maybe it's part of the solution of that discussion. Um, so crowd equity versus a limited company versus a cooperative. Um, Gerald from uh, my uh, business partner with Como Energy remarks that you could actually set up a proprietary limited company, a crowd equity company, like a cooperative with that sort of one member, one vote, if you wanted to. Um, an advantage we see with crowd equity or a, a proprietary limited company is it could um, own a share of a solar farm more easily or invite a sort of corporate or institutional investment investor to become a, say, 30% owner of the company. That would be more dip difficult with, or maybe impossible with a cooperative. Uh, pros and cons of debt. It's better known. Um, you don't have to buy insur asset insurance or hail protection insurance. You don't have all those ownership obligations and so on, so simpler. Um, but one beautiful thing about, say, the Goulburn Cooperative, Grong Grong Solar Farm and Haystack Solar Garden is it really achieves that additionality. So what is additionality? It's making something happen that would not have happened otherwise. So, for example, with Clear Sky Solar, they're helping businesses become more trustworthy of a finance solar model. Someone came to me and said, hey, I'm going to set up solar in your roof and sell it to you for 10 years. I'm like, show me the fine print. You know, <laughs> where, where's the, the dark evil bits? But having that trusted broker in between is unlocking additional solar that possibly would not happen otherwise. Grong Grong Solar Farm certainly would not have happened without those crowd equity investors, and they know that that's part of their motivation. Um, so uh, I think part of this discussion around debt versus equity, cooperative versus crowd and so on, is ensuring that um, you're achieving additional additionality, which is making a difference. All right, I think it's questions after Bryony. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
much, Jonathan and Nina. Um, we have Bryony O'Shea uh, from the Citizens Owned Renewable Energy Network Australia. Uh, so Karina have a revolving fund for rooftop solar and they're based in South Australia. Bryony, can you hear us? I can. Can you hear me? And just so we've got proof that the room isn't empty, how about everyone gives a shout out to Bryony? <laughs> Off you go. Thank you so much. Um, so Karina is South Australian based, but I'm actually joining you from the lands of the Bundjalung people of Northern New South Wales. Uh, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, and I'm very proud to say that I'm two kilometres down the road from one of the projects that um, Karina has supported in the New South Wales regional area. Um, I, I wouldn't have known that the LinkedIn photo was a tradition um, from today, but not being wanting to be the one to break the tradition, um, I did a quick calc and I'm pretty sure my LinkedIn photo is from 2013 um, with Jonathan before my two children were born. And um, the silver lining is that it's also the year that Karina was um, founded. So Karina's uh, in its 11th year now. And um, as um, as highlighted, it's a revolving fund um, focused at tackling the climate emergency. Um, but the power of the fund is that it's really, um, it's aimed at empowering um, everyday mum and dad donors to do whatever they can to um, tackle the climate emergency in whatever means that they can. Uh, and so, um, it was founded on this idea that um, I think it was um, Beyond Zero published a report that said if everybody donated $8 a week over 10 years, we would solve um, the energy crisis um, and none of us would need to exist and this conference wouldn't need to, to happen. Um, but of course, that's not the reality. Um, and initially, Karina was um, focused on solar PV, but as everyone would be well aware, um, solar is a lot more accessible to more people these days. And so as um, the climate emergency has evolved and our energy transition has progressed in Australia, so has Karina's focus on the types of projects that need funding. So, um, I'll try really hard in a picture to explain how the fund works. Um, essentially, it is based on anyone's donation. So five, ten, hundred dollar donations um, from regular and one-off donors, some uh, with a particular interest in a project that we're supporting or others just um, that like what we do and um, see it as a means to do their part. Uh, so Karina is, is quite simply a fund and we provide loans to organisations wanting to take action to address uh, the climate challenge. And it's a, it's a zero interest loan. So there are no, uh, there's no financing cost. Uh, there's no interest paid. And generally speaking, um, the loan repayments are paid using the savings from that organisation's um, energy savings. I can't hear you, Heather, but I can tell there's a problem because you're at the microphone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I can hear you now. Ah, were you trying to share slides because we can't see them? Oh, shoot. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's better that you mentioned that on slide two and not slide... 13. So thanks, Heather. <laughs> so this might help a tiny little bit. Um, we accept donations into Karina's revolving fund. We provide loans out to organisations. Um, they repay the, the loans using the savings from their energy bill. Um, so the, the sort of initial premise is that they're not out of pocket. Um, they're financially not any worse off and that organisation is able to continue to spend their money on the things that they exist for and that are their sort of primary reason. Um, the loan repayments return to the fund and then coupled with additional donations, uh, we continue to support new projects. Um, and possibly the best way to kind of quantify what that means um, is to give a few stats. 
So um, over the 11 years that Karina has existed, we've provided about $1.4 million in loans over 50 odd projects. Um, we achieved a megawatt of um, renewable energy just over a year ago. Um, and I think the important differentiator is that um, the $1.4 million in loans uh, has been funded by under $700,000 of donations. So this revolving um, attribute of the fund means that somebody donated 10 years ago um, and the dollars that they donate continue to revolve and to go on to fund subsequent projects after that initial donation. Uh, and so a way to, I guess, reflect what that looks like in terms of um, the makeup of the projects, um, I think, I think Jonathan, you mentioned something in the megawatt range where we've, we're in the 100 kilowatt range. Um, but our initial projects were of the sub $10,000 um, sort of order of magnitude. And you'll see from the, the graph, don't worry about the detail, just look at the colours. Um, the, the sort of orange is that the early projects were almost all via donations from our members. Um, and over time, more and more of the, the makeup of each loan is, is funded by loan repayments from previous loans. Um, and so with that, we rely less on donations for each project. Um, and as you can see by the chart, we've um, also grown the capacity to provide larger loans. So we're now in the order of over $100,000 um, loans, still small scale uh, in the scheme of the options that we're, we're talking through this afternoon, but certainly um, you know, empowering a lot of everyday Australians to do their bit. So as I mentioned, initially we uh, focused on solar PV systems um, and as they became more accessible and low interest and zero interest finance um, is more accessible to organisations, we've started to expand Karina's offering, particularly to try to identify parts of the energy transition that um, need further support. So um, electric vehicles still seem like a costly inve investment for organisations. So we try to support organisations that want to switch from fossil fuel to electric vehicles um, and look at energy efficiency opportunities to reduce um, power consumption for organisations where there's opportunity to greenify their electricity use. The types of organisations that we support, generally speaking, are non-profit community organisations of some sort, um, but that that's you know very sort of broad. Um, and we have we've also funded social enterprises that aren't necessarily a community organisation, but that they're you know they're aligned with the values that Karina um, represents and we're doing something to help shift the dial by supporting these organisations. So some of the more interesting ones are things like community housing cooperatives that um, tenants might otherwise really struggle to, to do something to reduce their energy um, usage, uh, reduce their power costs, and, and also um, have limited means to do something like install solar on their own roofs. There are a few projects that I just wanted to do a little bit of name dropping really. Um, so we've supported uh, Merriwa Industries um, with a close to 100 kilowatt installation. It was very much supported by both Goulburn Valley uh, Community Energy and Wangaratta Landclare and Sustainability. Um, and we do where we can partner or share information or work with other community organizations um, just to lighten everybody's load because we're obviously all quite stretched, all trying to achieve similar objectives. Um, and, you know, whether it's supporting another organisation that has a, a revolving fund but is struggling to get the projects or the like, um, we're really keen to partner with others where we can. Um, Family Centre in the Shoalhaven region of New South Wales was... Um, well supported by the local community fundraising for that um, that installation, which again also kind of provides that opportunity for people to have a personal connection to um, some of the projects that we fund. And as I mentioned, some of the um, community housing um, 
projects that we've funded range from Anglicare, um, community care in Lockington uh, and um, Abbeyfield Karingal, which was a, um, a housing development of six units for um, people with a disability to support independent living. So again, there was limited means for um, the tenants to, to have access to solar, um, but working with the, the um, developer, we were able to get, uh, put solar on those in, uh, houses as well. Uh, we're currently fundraising for um, a project that's um, open for funding. Um, and so I guess just to wrap up, I think I would say that um, the reason that we exist and the reason that we sort of uh, appeal to um, regular donors is that there's a connection to other community or charity organisations to help reduce their costs where they might not otherwise have the means to. Um, particularly when you think about perhaps the um, the the finances of some of these organisations that operate on a shoestring budget um, don't necessarily have uh, people within their organisation focused on things like optimisation or improvement versus, you know, if it's a housing shelter just focused on the reason that um, they're all turning up to work each day. So, um, that's a really sort of powerful connection, I think, for people that don't otherwise um, have the means to support those kinds of projects. Um, and also the revolving funds means, as I said, that if you donated um, $10 10 years ago, it's now worth quite a lot of money in terms of the investment that those dollars have made in community energy projects. And I think the last slide that I would finish on um, is just to highlight that whether people are aware of an organisation that needs a loan um, or whether there are people that uh, like the idea of a revolving fund and would like to start their own, we're not at all precious about the way that Karina operates and would love to share um, both our experiences and our templates and our ways of doing things with others. Um, and we do continue to work with like, the likes of Grong Grong, so Jonathan and Gerald, um, and wherever we can find an opportunity to partner with organisations to basically kind of shift the dial faster than we would on our own, we're more than happy to. I think that might be my time cue. Thank you, Brian. Excellent. If we can have the panellists, if we could um, have Nina John, we'd like to join us in a panel. And um, we have a few questions, if we just get everyone mic'd up. Uh, we have the first question here, and um, are on-bill credits tax exempt? Um, John, we might start with you, and maybe if you could explain what on-bill credit is. <laughs> yes, and probably more a question for Christy and Nigel. <laughs> Christy's there. Um, would you like to answer it? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I am. Um, involved in the Haystack Solar Garden project, which partnered with Como Energy and Pingala to bring to life. Um, so the question of on-bill credits uh, is a tricky one. Um, who here's got rooftop solar? How many of you export solar to the grid? Do any of you pay tax on that? Yeah, so that's the experience, right? but there's not an actual uh, ATO ruling one way or the other. So if the ATO wanted to, they could kind of say, well, actually, you're getting income and that should be blah, blah, blah. But they don't do that because it'd be really hard, right? So Haystacks is sort of relying on that because essentially um, having an on-bill credit from off-site solar will appear on your electricity bill in a similar way to exporting solar from your rooftop system would. So there's that. Um, and there's also um, folks that have been around for a while would know about Anova Energy, which was Australia's first community-owned um, electricity retailer, which was our original um, electricity partner. But sadly, they went into voluntary administration 
uh, in, in June 2022 as a result of um, the energy crises from pandemic and the war in Ukraine and lots of other things. Um, but they um, did the very first solar garden, a really small one that was putting solar on the Lismore community housing um, building in, in Lismore um, and enabled uh, 20 people that were tenants of, of that facility to get on bill credits. And they went through the process of getting a, a private ruling from the ATO to say that the on bill credits would not be treated as income. So there's not exactly a, a clear path to say that any other project would also be treated the same way, but there's lots of evidence to say that maybe they wouldn't. So anyway. Now, Christy, we might get you to stay. We'll let her off her volunteering role. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have another question. Uh, so this one's for you, Bryony. So how much of um, uh, of my dollar goes to the actual project versus admin fees? Oh, that's a, oh, that's great, a great question. question. Can, you hear, Can me? you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Right. <laughs> um, so as a donor to a project, all of your dollar goes to the project that we're funding. Um, so the answer is 100%. Um, we, we toyed with um, retaining some of the donation because um, it costs money to, to develop projects, to find projects, to do all of what we do. Um, but actually, it is the single biggest power of the Carina Fund that every dollar that you donate to a project goes to the project. Now, um, the slide that I showed that sort of demonstrated that the fund's getting bigger and bigger because more people are donating and the funds get revolved um, means that we have an in a continuously increasing pool of money that we need to find projects to, to continue to invest in to make those dollars, those donations work. Um, and two years ago, we were fortunate enough to be given a philanthropic donation specifically aimed at Karina employing our first project developer. So we have a head of operations um, who finds and develops projects and she is paid through philanthropic donations and people are very welcome to donate to our operations fund as opposed to our projects fund. Um, but the, the answer is if you donate a dollar to a project, all of it goes to that project. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question, um, I think we'll start with Nina, but if we can get a answer from all the panel, please. Uh, so uh, when you are looking at a project to finance, what are some of the red flags that you look for? What are some of the deal breakers? For me, um, yeah. yeah, we look at over, uh, it, it's different things. The first thing is uh, the size of the system, basically, how, um, because um, if it's too small, it doesn't really make sense for us. Uh, we look at how much energy is used on, on site. We normally get a credit worthy review, so we, we, we get a, a report, basically, in terms of, of credit risks uh, for the rooftop owner. Um, and then we look at, at kind of, I think, red flag things like, you know, uh, how likely is the company to survive? How long have they been in business? What's the business model, basically? Um, what's the probability that they will out, go out of business, um, et cetera, yeah. Um. John? Yeah, um, fantastic question. And I'm, I think as a graduate engineer in my 20s, someone said to me that uh, work is about risk management. And I kind of dismissed them, that sounds boring. And now I know it's all about risk management. Certainly what you do, you said risk averse, and for us developing and financing projects is all about risk management. Firstly, it's land. Um, do you have like secure uh, land holdings to go and start investing in the project? Investing means starting your grid studies and planning and engineering and these things. You don't want to go invest one, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars if you don't have the land fully secured and contracted. Next is um, planning. Will the community accept this project? Is it suitable for the local environment? Will you get approval? Uh, then it's um, around grid, all about grid connection, and we're still going through that today. Um, so do documents due. <laughs> um, and for a one and a half megawatt project, for example, we had to spend about seventy thousand dollars on grid studies 
uh, steady state and dynamic state studies, then protection studies, to test what the solar farm would do to the local grid. We do the engineering, send it to essential energy, they review it and so on. That took about uh, eight to 12 months going through those various stages. Um, so Como Energy's uh, initial uh, proposition was we would take projects through that phase. It's riskier, it requires more expertise. Um, but we're reconsidering that because the projects have taken sort of three years each and it's long and, and difficult. <laughs> so we're, we're considering the best option for our, our next projects. Um, so land, planning and grid connection would be the main ones. Great. Bryony, red flags? Yeah. Um, so I guess we take a similar kind of risk-based approach to assessing projects, but interestingly... Uh, we're probably at the other end of the, the scale that Karina, um, Christina mentioned. So um, if it's too big for Karina, it means um, people are going to, donors are going to feel that their money is sitting waiting to be put to work. Um, so we like to be able to fund projects in a reasonable time frame so that, um, so that we're actually not sitting on money, we're, we're funding um, emissions reduction. So the size of the project is um, a factor for us, but also protecting our donors' interests. So um, it's critical to Karina that we, we always have in mind that it's our donors that have created the fund and it's our donors who um, choose to fund projects because they believe in what Karina does. So we do care about investing in organisations that aren't necessarily 100% values aligned with us, but aren't contrary to, to any of Karina's values. Um, they are providing some sort of community benefit because um, it's our community that we're interested in helping to empower. Um, and of course, their financial viability, their ability to pay, uh, repay the loan over the, the term that we set are all critical again for protecting those um, donors. Great. Money. And Christy, from um, perhaps um, some of the go, no go? Red flags yeah. perspective? So for the Haystack Soul Garden project, um, we initially started um, with the idea to have an equity model. So people would be purchasing shares and the, the Haystacks cult would own the Soul Garden, um, which is housed within the um, Grong Grong Solar Farm. Um, it's a very complicated legal structure now because going through a pandemic, we started this project in 2020. Um, Obviously, everyone knows lots of things changed in that time um, and it affected our project a lot. Um, and we got to a point where we kind of had to say, well, we're asking people to, you know, invest in this project to purchase a plot. Initially, it was going to be owning a plot of... and the, the plot would be in the, the solar farm they collectively owned. Um, but we had to eventually decide to go to um, a debt model because we wanted to, to make sure for... Australia's first large-scale solar garden, that the returns could be as certain as possible and we would reduce the risk as much as we possibly could for people that were purchasing um, solar garden plots. Um, so for us, yeah, risk came into it a whole lot. Um, that's why we decided to go with the, the debt model. And in that whole process, um, like our... Organisation is set up as a cooperative because we wanted to bake in democratic structures into like the way that we operate. And part of that was um, making sure that all of the members had a say at certain points. And so before we actually gave the loan to Grong Grong Solar Farm for construction, we went through a, a due diligence process um, and we engaged a, a separate... Um, uh, entity, it was um, ITP Renewables that did a due diligence process on um, Coma Energy actually and um, part of that was for them to go through and do a bit of a red flag analysis of what does the design look like, what's your finance model look like, what are all these various other parts and through that process um, it was really quite collaborative and they could say oh we're concerned about this and then that gave Como a chance to respond and then improve it if necessary or say oh, it's, it's that way because of this. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that's having a third party doing due diligence if you're going to be partnering with a, a commercial entity is important, but also the whole way through making sure you're working with partners that you really trust and can build a relationship. So if there is something that you think, well, I don't know about that, or I don't understand it, you have the confidence to talk to them about it and say, 
what does that mean? Why are you doing it this way? And that they'll respect you for asking questions and it won't be a problem. Great, thank you, Christy. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. I can start. Um, we've got a lot of this information. We're doing a, a knowledge sharing session on Haystack Solar Garden um, on the 28th of March. Um, if you want to come to that, sign up to the CPA newsletter. Um, but we didn't have any objections um, in the planning process for that. And I think a large part of that was because of the community engagement we've done on the ground and, and with people. So that's that's a really important part of it. Um, but I've, I've seen other projects where they have had opposition. Um, we also work with large scale developers and for some it, it makes them reassess how they're approaching the whole situation and they kind of go in with their tail between their legs back to the community and say, oh, okay, we've seen from our, our the objections you put in that you don't like it, let's, let's redesign this. So sometimes it gives larger developers an opportunity to do it again. Um, not always though. I should have acknowledged Sarah Reed from Zero Suburb Canberra. <laughs> uh, do we have another question from the audience? Yes, please. Oh, first, please introduce yourself and then. Well, that, that, that's an absolutely wonderful question, yeah. Um, we have companies uh, in our area, that's Brookwell basically, and theoretically there's, um, there's no constraint at the, uh, at the substation, we've looked into that, but the businesses are, some of the businesses are being curtailed, um, especially the ones that have really, really large solar systems. So, and, and I think that's where we need to really get support from the state government, basically, to work with Ausgrid in our case. And, and we, we had someone speak from Ausnet earlier. We need to get the grid operators to come on board and we need to find solutions that, that stop us limiting the energy production that, that's produced locally. And there's another issue related to that. There's no real incentive for businesses to optimize the use of their roof space. We're wasting massive amounts of solar infrastructure right where that energy is consumed. And we need to call on the state governments basically to help us put pressure onto Ausgrid to basically create new tariff structures that will make it attractive for businesses to actually use the whole roof. And, you know, we're talking about the two-way tariff, Ember, Osgrid basically currently. Uh, it's not necessarily available for businesses. It should be available for businesses. It should not be reduced in the coming years because it will incentivize the installation of batteries and optimize that localized support for grid infrastructure with batteries and it will incentivize the use of the roof space that we already have. And our last question, please, yes. Uh, Dennis Lambert, Sustainable Upper Oven. The issue, you've all been talking about business, but there's a very big group of people out there who are being missed out, and they are the homeowners who can't afford to get a leg up into this field. None of us are prepared to really have a good look at this, and I've been looking at it, but the Credit Act really is a major hindrance uh, because once we give a person an interest-free loan, that affects their credit rating. Have any of you put any thought into this at all? And why are you all avoiding it? <laughs> um, I could probably answer something from Rewiring Australia, and it's watch this space. 
probably similar to Vicky, I've been a former councillor. Victoria has been ahead of us with environmental upgrade agreements. They're currently available in New South Wales for businesses, not for, for residential, and they should be. So we're working with our elected member, Michael Reagan, who is very supportive. He's pushing for interest-free free loans from the New South Wales government for households to really address the issue that you have been talking for. So talk to your local members, basically get that support for interest-free loans and for environmental upgrade agreements. I'm not an expert on the topic, but uh, Brighty provide that interest-free loan, but I think you're simply paying the interest up front, so it's added to the solar installation cost. And I think Solar Victoria uh, ha have in the last couple of years been providing a $1,400 additional subsidy on top of the STC and a $1,400 interest-free loan. So they can bring like a 6.6 .6 kilowatt system from $7,000 down to about $4,000 to, to make it more affordable. We have looked at all of those and there are serious problems if you have a credit rating issue. Um, they will not go near you. And yet, as we saw this morning, Indeed, it's a problem to be solved. I can say for Grong Grong, you can invest from, people invested from $250, so that's something. <laughs> um, I'd just like to thank everyone and our panellists, if you could give them a round of applause. <laughs> and just one last thing for the day, if I could please introduce um, Mari Lakey, uh, who's also a board member of the Coalition for Community Energy, but also um, from Yarra Energy Foundation. Great. Um, thanks so much, Vicky. Um, so I just wanted to do something very embarrassing at the end of the day and say a big thank you to the key coordinators for this event. Um, without them, this couldn't have happened and it's been a real marathon effort. So I'd like to invite um, Heather and Juliet down to the, the front here. <laughs> you. You're very naughty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we just wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of the C4C board. Um, yeah, they've put in countless hours of overtime and volunteer time, and it's, it's huge. Um, so, yeah, a big round of applause again.